If you watched our MOT Matters edition about common mistakes, you'll remember that Robert attempts to be a tester. Well, he fancies another go. So he's inside our training centre here in Chatterton, donning his workwear and brushing up on the inspection manual. So this should be fun. What Robert doesn't know is the inspection manual will change on the 1st of January 2012 to bring in some new items. This is owing to European regulations changing. But I think I'll wait and tell him about that. You ready for another go, Robert? Hello, Brian, I am. I'm a, I'm a glutton for punishment. Yeah. As this is really a training exercise, and you're not a qualified nominated tester, I've already registered the vehicle for you on a VTS device. Great, and I've done the uh, pre-checks, but Brian, I noticed that this vehicle isn't actually of testable age, so I'm wondering if I can smell a rat here. Not exactly a rat, Robert, but I suppose I'd better come clean. The manual is being brought into line with the new European Directive from 2012, sometimes referred to as 2010 stroke 48 stroke EU. I feel better for knowing that. Now, now, we need a modern vehicle. Won't this be an extra burden for testers? Well, to be honest, the additional items are quite straightforward. And VOS has done its best to keep any increase in time the test takes to a minimum, as well as the need to test any additional items. And what about equipment? Once again, that's been kept to a minimum. And we'll see what's required when we get to those parts of the test. Why the change in the first place? Well, minimum test requirements have long been enshrined in European law, and they apply throughout the European Union but mainly the changes are in response to the technological advances on modern vehicles. And do they apply across all of the classes? In the main, the changes affect all classes except motorcycles. And when do these changes actually take effect? 1st of January 2012, but the changes to the brake performance criteria will not be introduced until September 2013. Shall I make a start? Good idea. And I'll point out the new test items as we go. This vehicle has most of them. Great, sounds like a plan. Already? There must be quite a few changes. Well, the first one is seat adjustment. What do I need to know? You need to check that the driver's seat can be adjusted and secured in position. So, moved uh, from where we are, new position, check that it locks. That's right. What's next? Well, while you're there, what's the view like? Oh, yeah, of course. It's uh, windscreen, mirrors, etc. Well remembered, but now with one addition. Lots of vehicles are fitted with what we call indirect vision devices, cameras. So what do we do with them? Well, that's the easy bit. The checks are exactly the same as they are for mirrors. Missing, obscured, etc. So the view is seriously impaired. That sounds straightforward. On with the steering? Yeah, while you're about to do the steering checks, there's a change here as well. What's that? Well, the steering lock mechanism needs checking. And what does that involve? Well, basically take out the key and turn the wheel to make sure the steering lock engages, then put the key back in and make sure it releases. And what about vehicles that actually don't have a steering lock fitted? Well, if the manufacturer didn't fit a steering lock, then it's not testable. And it's important to note that this check only applies to certain vehicles. And those are identified in the information column of section 2.1? Well done, mate. I'm impressed. You've been reading the manual. And what about electronic steering locks? Well, these will fail if the malfunction indicator light on the dashboard is illuminated. You also need to be aware that on some systems, the lock may only activate if the driver's door is opened or closed. The information is all in the usual place. OK, then, what else? Well, quite a few things still to do from the driver's seat, and next up is the speedo. Time for a road test? Yeah, you'll be lucky you won't come back. No, the checks are exactly the same as what we do for Class 5s. We check it's fitted, it's intact, and it all lights up. So shall I continue and test the controls? Yeah, continue, but you now also have another check to consider. What's that? Well, the front and rear position lamps must turn on by one operation of the switch and the number plate light should come on with them. So the one person testing mirrors are an assistant coming into play again? Correct, yeah, and as you check for the operation of the lights, you need to check for the main beam warning light. See it there? Yeah, this one's working. Any other warning lights we need to consider? Oh, very perceptive of you, Robert. Well, you did say these uh, new items were to do with electronic safety systems, so what are they? Well, you need to check the malfunction indicator lamp for electronic power steering, for electronic stability control and for electronic park brake. Also for brake fluid level, 
for tyre pressure monitoring systems and for secondary restraint systems. But couldn't it be confusing? For example, isn't the brake warning lamp the same as the parking brake lamp? It could be, so make sure the parking brake is off. Fair enough. What about the uh, secondary restraint system warning lamp? Same rules apply, really. If the lamp is indicating a fault or it's not working, that would be a failure, as would a missing or defective airbag. And when you're checking the seat belt, if you see the pretension has gone off, sometimes indicated by a little flag... Oh, yeah, I remember that. We advise the customer, don't we? Not anymore. It's a foul. We also have to check the presence of any seat belt load limiters fitted as standard. These are usually a torsion bar type system, aren't they? Uh, to minimise uh, seat belt inflicted injury in particularly violent crashes. That's right, but mostly they'll be hidden away behind panels. Now, there is another type that uses folded webbing, but they're far less common. But if the seat belt limit had obviously been deployed, then that would be a reason for ejection. It's all explained in a new section 5.4 of the manual. Then you mentioned the tyre pressure monitoring system. Do we just check that the warning lamp again is working and not indicating a fault? Exactly that, but it's important to note that the checks on tyre pressure monitoring systems only applies to passenger vehicles first used on or after the 1st of January 2012. Now, you also mentioned about uh, electronic stability control. I did, and there's a huge number of acronyms for stability control systems. Yes, on my vehicle it's um, ESP. Well, that's quite common. It is on mine, but it can also be called DSC, ASC, VSC, or in fact anything that the vehicle manufacturer decides to call it. But are the checks the same as for the other warning lamps? Oh, yeah, we check it's present, it's working, it's not indicating a fault. And also, if the stability control system has a switch to turn it off, then that would fail if it was insecure or faulty. Well, that's fine, but you have to be quick to check all these malfunction indicator lamps, don't you? Because they all come on at once. Mm. And if any indicator fault, then that's a fail. It is. But a vehicle should only be rejected if it's clear that a lamp is indicating a system malfunction. OK, that's straightforward enough. What next? Well, this vehicle has an electronic park brake, so we need to check that it hasn't been repaired or modified in such a way that would obviously adversely affect the roadworthiness of the vehicle or any of the associated components have been seriously weakened. We also need to check that the controls in place, secure and accessible. And as we've discussed, the tester needs to check that the electronic park brake warning lamp isn't indicating a fault. That's right. Let's get on with the test. <laughs> Well done. I see you've remembered not to tap the lights, but did you notice this vehicle has headlight cleaning jets? I did. New testable item? Quite right. But not all new vehicles have these, Brian. No, that's because they're only required on HID or LED headlamps with a light output greater than 2,000 lumens. It sounds complicated. Yeah, they're also difficult to identify. And what's more, this type of headlight generally requires a self-levelling system. Do we have to check them as well? Yeah, we do. But there's quite a bit of guidance in section 1.7 on what to look for. And if the tester's not sure if the self-leveling system's working, then the benefit of doubt should be given to the presenter. Anything else new here? Well, apart from damage and deterioration of the lamp, if there's anything on the lens or the light source which significantly reduces the light output, then that would be a foul, and that would apply to all lights now. What kind of things could be covering the lamp? Well, tinting film or paint, etc. And remember, at least 50% of light sources within a lamp must be working. So, like lamps that are made of uh, LEDs, uh, half of those have to be lit? Yeah, quite right. Yeah. Some new items here, Robert. Inside the rear? Well, not exactly. We now have to check that the rear doors open from the outside with the relevant control and then close securely. Also, for any door, if a hinge, door catch, pillar is damaged, missing or deteriorated so the door doesn't function properly, then that would be a foul. And what about Class 5s? Yeah, good point. For Class 5s, we check any passenger entry or exit door for damage or deterioration that interferes with their function or might cause injury and also, if there's a warning device 
to alert the driver for a passenger door being open, then that must work. And if the emergency exit is via a brake glass, do we test the hammer? Well, we test the hammers there, but we don't smash the window. And if a passenger entrance or exit emergency door control doesn't work, that would be a fail. Now, that could be a remote control, maybe in the driver's compartment or above the door itself. It's all explained in section 6.2. What about the emergency door and window signs? Do they have to be there? They do, and any that are missing or illegible will fail. Well, that's simple enough, and as I was opening the doors to check the, the rear seats and belts, it doesn't really take any longer, does it? So, talking of belts, do you remember the extra check? Just looking again for pre-tensioner flags, etc. Well done. Well, before we start here, Robert, there's something new here too. Any ideas? Well, we already test uh, the tow bar. But not the electrics. So what do I need to know? Right, well, this vehicle hasn't got a tow bar, but I've got one over here that has. Great. Tommy is going to check the lights for us. Hello, Hi. Tom. Hi, Brian. Right? Right? Yeah. yeah, not too bad. Robert, it's good to see you. Overall's on. Almost an engineer. <laughs> Almost. It's like having a film star making a guest appearance. <laughs> You're going to do the lights for us, are you? I am, and I always knew you'd need me. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> do you know him? I've never seen him before, oh, so actually. Humour him. Yeah. Right, the 13-pin electrical socket will have to be tested using this new bit of kit. I'll just plug it in. Very impressive, Brian. Do we use that to test all tow bar electrical sockets? Good question, that, Rob. No, it's only used to test 13-pin sockets because they're wired in accordance with an ISO standard. So we don't test the 7-pin uh, sockets that you see commonly about? No, only for damage or deterioration that would prevent you connecting the lead securely. Um, we also do a visual check on security and condition of the wiring, which will apply as we go around the vehicle. So what are we looking for? Well, any wiring that's chafing, damaged, um, rubbing, could short out. Any exposed wiring where the insulation is damaged would be a foul. There's a new section 1.9 in the manual that will explain this. And that could mean the wiring on hybrids? Oh, yeah, it'll cover all hybrid and electric vehicles, but you need to be careful. If you see defects on high-voltage cables, you need to consider whether it's safe to continue. Uh, what about the tow bar itself? Well, we've been testing tow bars now for a couple of years, but we've now also got to check for inappropriate repairs or modifications. And what if the tow bar is behind a panel? What do I do then? Well, normal rules apply there. If the access panel can be removed without the use of tools, then we can test it. And what about a removable tow ball? Well, if the brackets and the electrics are still there, then we'll test them. Great. You turn the side lights on, Tom. A few extra things to check under the bonnet, Robert. What are they, Brian? Well, a lot of testers used to believe that the battery was testable. It is now. We need to check it secure and not leak an electrolyte. And what about on a vehicle where the, the battery's under a cover or, like on this car, the battery's actually in the boot under the spare wheel? Well, no dismantling. So if we can't access it, we can't test it. And also, as we mentioned earlier, we need to check that all the electrical wiring is in good condition and secure. And you said there were several other items? Yeah, there's some additional checks to carry out on the fuel and exhaust system. And what are they? Well, we can now fail fuel pipes if they're chafing or excessively damaged. Not before time? Yeah, quite so. Also, if a vehicle requires a full cat test, then the catalytic converter must be present. Uh, wouldn't it fail the uh, emissions test if the converter wasn't present? Probably, but not necessarily. OK, and what about the steering? Yeah, you need to check the power steering fluid level. Now, this is a visual check only, so where you can see through a reservoir or through a sight glass, basically the same as you do for the brake fluid level. And so if the fluid is below the minimum level, it's a fail? It will. And also, when we're checking power steering pipes and hoses, there's a new reason for ejection for excessive corrosion. Anything else with the power steering? Yeah, in the event that you find a power steering component that's been inappropriately repaired or modified, then it would fail. Those terms keep cropping up, don't they, Brian? Yeah, they're becoming a common theme in some sections, so you'll be hearing them again. Let me guess, to do with the braking system? That's right. We already covered this in respect of some items, such as brake pipes and hose fittings, but it now applies to pretty much the whole braking system. Is that it for brakes? We also need to check 
the condition and presence of ABS and electronic stability programme components, and that will obviously continue when we get underneath the vehicle. Oh, and we need to check any visible wiring. So shall I raise the hoist? No, not quite yet. Another new item we'll have to consider is the engine mountings. I've always wondered why they weren't testable. What will be the fail criteria there? Well, is it doing its job of securing and locating the engine? If it is, pass. So let's do the underside check. OK. <laughs> Oh, well, all right. Now, under the bonnet, we talked about power steering. So we might as well talk about additional checks to the steering. Um, and the first thing to consider is that if a steering box is fitted, we need to check it for all leaks. And any leak would fail? No, not at all. It would need to be a significant leak. Also, another thing to be aware of is a new reason for ejection for steering lock stop missing. Where previously we only had to check them for security and correct adjustment. Yeah, you're right, well remembered. Also on external power steering systems, if a component is fouling or seriously misaligned, then that would be a foul. And I suppose there are more checks for inappropriate modification or repairs. Yep, you got it. So how do we know that inappropriate? Well, there's a new paragraph on this in the introduction to the manual, but basically, has it been altered in such a way that makes it unfit for its purpose? So if we're looking at the steering in terms of uh, repairs and modifications, I guess we're looking for the same with the suspension. Yeah, and the criteria is just the same. So what else in this area? Well, the drive shafts. You now have to check any support bearing and the inner, as well as the outer constant velocity joint gator. In the case of gators, I suppose we'll be looking for tears and splits, but what are the criteria for support bearings? Well, we simply check that the support bearing is not excessively worn. And yes, you're right about the gators. The criteria is that it prevents the ingress of dirt, etc. So what about the covers on steering and suspension ball joints? Are they now testable? They are, Robert. And the criteria is that the dust covers must prevent the ingress of dirt. And we'll get a better look at uh, those items when we jack the front suspension and inspect from the wheel arch. Now, what about uh, a rear-wheel drive with a prop shaft? Prop shafts are not part of the test, Rob. And what about rear drive shafts that form part of the suspension? Well, as you know, Rob, these drive shafts are already testable. So, yes, you will also have to check any support bearing or any gaiter. OK, and we've also got the under-bonnet items that we discussed earlier that need looking at from underneath the vehicle like fuel and exhaust systems. Uh, but tell me about these additional checks on the braking system that you mentioned. Well, not surprisingly, inappropriate repairs or modifications to the system. And the assessment criteria are the same as steering and suspension? Yeah, exactly the same. And then we mustn't forget, we also need to check for defective um, ABS and ESC components that we discussed during the underbonnet checks. Yeah, that's right. So any obvious damage or defect on such a thing as an ABS exciter ring would result in a foul. What about mechanical brake components? Uh, any additional checks there? Yeah, there are. Firstly, any brake cable, rod or clevis joint insecure would result in a failure and we have to check the condition and operation of brake slack adjusters. Aren't they usually found on larger vehicles with air brake systems and we'd need an assistant operating the brakes? Yeah, that's correct. Also, some vehicles are fitted with load sensing valves which now need to be checked that they're operative correctly adjusted, not seized, and don't have a defect that impairs their function. How do you know that? Well, you'd look for valve movement on operation of the brake pedal, or free movement of lever arms, or pistons, etc. But, for testers in doubt, pass and advise. Great. Are we done underneath? No, there's one more additional item to check while we're underneath. Which is? If the vehicle can run on LPG or CNG, and the tester suspects a leak, then he can confirm it by using this spray. So I don't spray that everywhere? No, only if you suspect a leak, otherwise it could get expensive for you. Of course. OK, let's press on, remembering that if there's a tow bar, we also need to check that for inappropriate repairs or modification and corrosion, which was always in the test. Yeah. <laughs> So in addition to all the normal checks, uh, I'm looking for any inappropriate repair or modification to the steering or suspension, uh, the drive shaft uh, coupling gaiters, both inner uh, and outer. I can't actually see the support bearing, but I I'd check that if I, if I could see it. I'm also looking for inappropriate uh, brake system repairs or modification and defective ABS or ESC components. All correct, Robert. 
but don't forget the steering and suspension joint dust covers. And we may have uh, been able to see those when we were underneath. Oh, possibly. But here's another chance to have a good look to see whether the dust cover's missing or not capable of keeping the dirt out. Great, so all done here. I'll get on with the rest of the test. Go for it, Rob. Before I start, Brian, any changes that I should know about? Well, from September 2013, the efficiency and imbalance requirements will change. However, that's for another day. I look forward to that. The only change that's happening at the moment is if you do a decelerometer test, there's an extra fail item. If the vehicle swerves excessively when the park brake's applied, the vehicle will fail, but nothing else to worry about at the moment. And any changes for other classes? Well, in addition to what we've covered, there's a couple of additional checks that apply to Class 5 only. Such as? Well, in Section 6.1, we have to check passenger stairs and steps for security, and they're not in a condition likely to cause injury or to trip someone up. And we also check the anti-slip provision. Well, I don't think I could uh, manage a test without you by my side, Brian. Yeah, I'm sure. And the new items don't seem too onerous, just a bit more to remember as you go through the routine. And to be honest, they're part and parcel of what a tester would be looking at anyway, so I don't think that'd add much time to the test itself. That's right, Robert. And once testers know the new items and the criteria, they shouldn't have a problem. So that's you finished playing being a tester? It is. It's been fun. But I think we should go home now. Good idea. Off into the sunset, so to speak.